Welcome back to another week of C3 Home at Home. We are so excited that you have joined us. Wherever you're watching this, whatever platform you're on, we're, we're just pumped you could be with us. Now, if you are on our online platform right now, we want you just to say hello, put a little wave emoji, whatever you want to do there. Um, and if you're watching this, maybe through YouTube after, leave some comments or, hey, subscribe to the channel because there's a lot of good content on here. Am I right, live studio audience? Yeah. All right, yeah, cool. Okay, so I do have a live studio audience and, and I just got to warn you, they are extremely um, uh, vocal and encouraging, uh, maybe even over encouraging sometimes. So, uh, but hey, uh, if you're new to all this, we want to let you know something. Uh, we believe that there is a message that needs to be heard. The whole world needs to hear it, especially you, that uh, it's called the good news of the gospel, that you are loved, you're included, and there's nothing God can't change. And we want you not to um, just hear that. We, want, we actually want you to be transformed by that beautiful reality and so if you're new to this for the next few moments give us a blank canvas because i believe god can tr he can radically transform your life if you and i would just give him the space and so Amen. whatever your week's been like your life has been like it might be this in the worst place it might be in a mediocre place an average place it might be in the best place either way uh, god's still got transforming he wants to do and he loves you he loves you we want you to know that and, uh, and be transformed by that today. But hey, we're jumping into a conversation that we actually started, uh, it, it was 10 weeks ago. Wow. So we've had a 10 week conversation around a book in the Bible called <laughs> Philippians. And uh, this is actually the last part of that series. Oh. That was, I, was, I was glad to hear a collective <laughs> sigh on that one, not a yay. <laughs> right, I'm so done with that. No, but we hope you've enjoyed the series. And if you missed any of it, you can go back on our YouTube channel. Uh, and what we've done is we, we actually wanted to, in this time, the COVID-19 season, speak into what I believe is a really important topic uh, that we actually need to speak into the despair, the hopelessness, the, the feelings that people are going through, and not just to um, empathize, sympathize, which we do, but also to bring uh, what I believe to be an answer in these moments. And so this series is all about um, a book in the Bible called Philippians. And really the theme of the book is joy. It's joy. And I don't know about you, but I want more joy in my life. Yeah. I really do. And, and, and this actually is the byproduct, um, not of just positivism and good thinking. All those things are great, but it's actually the byproduct of God at work in people's lives. Yeah. True joy, pure yeah. joy, unshakable joy. Wow. And we call this series The Loudest Voice. Because we do want this, uh, we, we do want the voice of God to be the loudest, not fear, not despair, but actually of God. And so uh, this last part of the series, I'm excited to, uh, to share. And next week we start a whole new series, which you do not want to miss out on. It's going to be unreal. You'll hear more about that later. But here we go. This is in Philippians chapter four. And we're going to read uh, from verse 10 here today. Wherever you're watching this, if you want to follow along, there's a note section underneath uh, our online platform. Click that. But here we go. It says this, how I praise the Lord that you are concerned about me. Paul writing from isolation from prison, he says, I know you have always been concerned for me, but you didn't have the chance to help me. Verse 11, watch this. Not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with what, whatever I have. Now, I know about you, but that, is, that would be a difficult thing to say, like to be content. And he actually says, I've learned this. I've learned contentment. He says, I know how to live on almost nothing, yeah. right? Nothing or with everything. In other words, he's like, I know how to live with, with, with poverty, with deep, dark times, with a paleo diet, with nothing, right? <laughs> to, to plenty, right? He knows how to go through it all. But catch this, he says, I've learned the secret of living in every situation. I love this. And here's his secret. Whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little, verse 13, I can do everything yeah. through Christ who gives yeah. me strength. Good. We're going to stop there, but I'll read that last one. For I can do everything, highs, lows, in between. I can do it all through Christ who gives me strength. Yeah. Um, today on this last part, part 10 of our Loudest Voice series, I want to speak to you from the topic, the title to pick your curiosity, Joy Under Pressure. Oh, wow. Joy Under Pressure. And, and I do not want to be in any way, shape or form uh, ignoring the fact that there's a lot of people watching this and you are under pressure yeah. and you have felt under pressure in this season. Uh, and I believe that through the help of God and through the outworking of his love in our lives and the Holy Spirit, you can actually experience a joy even under pressure. Yeah. 
And I believe that is the result uh, of, of what Jesus does. And we're going to package that today. If you're interested in, in learning joy under pressure, hey, stick around because uh, this, I believe, is really, really relatable to you. So let's pray before we jump into this message. So Lord, God, I thank you for today. I thank you for just the moments that we get to share together. Uh, wherever we're watching this, Lord, I pray that God, that you are there and we don't need to be in a space because you are everywhere. But Lord, I thank you that as we, we, even though we are separated by distance, we're together. We are together in these moments. And I pray that people would feel that, that we are in this together. They're not alone through this season, but I also pray that through your presence, through your love, through your Holy Spirit, God, there's going to be a joy that fills every home, every heart that listens to this and watches this. God, because truly you do give us joy under pressure. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. 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 amen, amen. So um, let me ask you this question. Have you ever overreacted? Yeah, yeah. A little bit. <laughs> There's people in the audience and I saw them looking at other people in the audience going, pretty sure that's you. Uh, okay. Let, by, but, but like you're watching this right now. Have you ever overreacted? Now, if someone in your family, or maybe they're watching this with you right now, just give them a little nudge and say, hey, sometimes <laughs> you potentially overreact, right? It's, it's even happening right now in the audience. People are pushing each other. And my wife was pointing at me. <laughs> What's that all about? Guilty. Okay, look, I, I can have the tendency to overreact. Like if you are a more dramatic person, this is probably something that you will do quite often. If you're a dramatic person, um, give me a little high five emoji on the platform. If you're a dramatic person in the audience, give me a woo. <laughs> that was everyone. Wow. Okay. So, uh, like, I, I can be a little, um, I can be a little over the top sometimes. Okay, not all the time. I'm a reasonably level-headed person, um, self-aware, but every now and then I can overreact. Okay. Uh, now, there's this one particular situation I'll, I'll let you in on where I may have overreacted. I may have overreacted. Um, I, I, I'm a huge fan of shark documentaries. I love shark documentaries. Does anyone else like shark documentaries? Shark. I love them. Okay, I love them. Um, here's the issue. Um, shark documentaries have done no favours for me because I am a surfer. I enjoyed the water. I enjoyed the beach. And so that means I am constantly in the environment where these sharks exist and I have a great imagination. And so I typically think about those shark documentary moments while I'm out in the surf. Like I think about it often. And so this is plaguing my mind. It's not, it's not smart, is it? It's kind of like, it's like a vegan watching a barbecue show. Like it's not good for you, right? So you, you, you shouldn't do that because it's feeding something in you. Okay. So uh, my, my, I'm actually um, surfing one time. Uh, this is up on the north coast of New South Wales. And, and as I'm surfing, I, I, I'm, I'm with a friend and he gets a wave, I get a wave and we're literally kind of like waist deep about to walk back out and a wave comes just ahead of us and we're just going to chuck our boards, jump underneath it because it was a little bit shallower. And as the wave comes, this massive shadow goes through the wave, like this massive, massive shadow. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's a shark. I pushed him, said, I'm young, swam in. No, I'm joking, I didn't. Uh, but I went and uh, you know, quickly got in because I realised it wasn't a dolphin, it was a shark. And, and so I'm like, man, we probably shouldn't go out again. Then the next day, we go back out around the corner uh, to where we were the day before. So I'm out in the surf and I'm feeling eerie. Like I'm, it's feeling a bit weird. It's feeling like, I, I, I don't really trust what's happening here. Uh, but as I sat up on my board, I thought, get over it. It's, there's nothing there. You're fine. The Lord protects you, right? <laughs> I'm trying to tell myself that. And so I get a wave. And as I start going along this wave, like I'm I don't know, a couple of 360s, few airs. <laughs> It's my story, okay? It's my story. I'll elaborate if I want. And, and then I look next to me and this fin comes up next to me in the water. And, and I'm like, I freak out. And here's the, here's the thing. Like, I've watched many shark documentaries. Um, and what I do know is that I won't be one of those guys who gets interviewed for surviving them. Let me explain. You know, those guys who are like, yeah, yeah, I, I, I fought and I got away and so on. See, see, in the heat of the moment, instead of you know, like going in, my brain's like, there's a shark, get out, like jump away. So I'm literally on the wave and I see this fin. And I'm like, ah, and I jumped, <laughs> off, I jumped off my board. I'm true story. I jumped into the water and you're thinking, James, you're an idiot. Whatever, like I was, I was under pressure, right? And as I go into the water, I'm like, for, I'm waiting for that moment where it's going to grab me and swing me around. And that's not Snowflake. <laughs> anyway, that's an old it's Ace Ventura joke. Anyway, so, uh, but I'm waiting for that to happen. And I come out of the water. My heart is like literally beating out of my chest. And this stinking dolphin just, bling, you know, go, eh, goes past me. I'm like, I hate you. You know, like I, I was, I was petrified for the rest of the day. I couldn't even, I couldn't even sit still. Like I was shaking from the fear. 
The moral of the story is I did myself no favors because here's the thing. I had fed my mind so much fear of sharks through these documentaries that when the moment of pressure came, I reacted in fear. I reacted in fear. And, and I, I go as far to say this, whatever you feed your soul with will come out when you are under pressure. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever you feed your soul with. So do not always be surprised with the way you react or should I say overreact because typically what you have put in is what's coming out. Yeah, so under pressure, life forces you to actually bring to the surface what is really within you. Yeah. What's really within you. And in that moment, fear came out. Why? Because I had fed fear. Wow. I'd fed fear and fear caused that under pressure. Fear came to the surface. Fear came out. Mm. Let, me, let, let me put it to you this way. I saw this illustration years ago and I thought, I've never done it. Let's do this. I'm going to live studio audience person. Just let me get my prop here. Uh, Satch, why don't you come on? Why don't you welcome Satch to the studio audience just for a moment? <laughs> Satch is great, and uh, yes, he's just going to see. So here's the thing: if I was to product placement, um, but <laughs> you can't actually, not that product. Are uh, you grab a seat for a sec? Yeah, thank you. Uh, look, uh, if your life is is a vessel, which it is, your life is a vessel, and you've got to be very careful what you allow into that vessel, because what's in will eventually come out. Come out. Come out. It'll eventually come out. So I'll go as far to say this. I remember hearing this as a kid. I think it was in kids' church. That when, when you are squeezed, what comes out of you? What is the thing that comes out of your life? Do you like how I had to do this over a cup? <laughs> what, what comes out when you're squeezed? Yeah. Yeah. Now, in this moment, can, can I put this out there to you? We have never, as a human race, been more squeezed than we are right now. Mm. I feel, in recent times, at least. Yeah. We have had our lives under pressure... And under pressure, what is in you comes out of you. What is inside you right now? Because pressure actually just causes that thing to come to the surface. It does. I'm going to hand this back. Satch, there's, uh, you might want to, you can brush your teeth. Okay, so um, this is really um, an important question we must ask in these times. Because what you maybe experience right now is, um, I don't know why I'm reacting this way with this particular thing. And, and what I want to submit to you that maybe, just maybe, you fed your soul with some things and this life moment, this pressure moment, has just brought it to the surface. Yeah, wow. That's what it's done. Mm -hmm. It was always there. It's just that pressure brought it up. Yeah. Pressure brought it out. And, and here's the thing. Pressure does truly reveal what is inside of us. Yeah. Yeah. It really does. And, and this is where we come back to this portion of Scripture. Paul is writing from a prison from isolation, from a potential, like this is his green mile. This is where he might be actually sentenced to death for so his faith. Yeah. Yeah. And joy comes out of him. Wow. Wow. Peace comes out of him. Wow. And Paul is, again, I have to specify, this is not because Paul is a positive person. It's not because Paul's superhuman. Because when we read these books and we read scripture, we often do that. We say, oh, but that's them and they were an apostle or they were a great man or woman of God. But understand, the Bible actually says they were men and women just like you and I. Yeah. Yeah. They were no different. But there were some things that they did do that did make them really stand out in moments, especially moments of pressure. Yeah. There's a reason why when the Christian church was scattered in its early infant stages where people were actually thrown to lion's dens, persecuted and put to death for their yeah. faith, while many of them sang hymns whilst being lit on fire. Oh, wow. What is that? What causes that? And I'm here to tell you, it's not, well, they're just, again, superhuman. Maybe there was a supernatural strength inside of them that when pressure came, it came out. Yeah. And so Paul is, Paul is actually saying, this is what's happened to me. Yeah. This is not who, listen, stop for a second. This is not who Paul was. This is what happened to Paul. Because you make, oh, well, that's just who he is and that's just who they are. Then you actually ne you negate the fact that it could happen for you. It actually happened to Paul. Paul had experienced the love of Christ, the transforming power of God to such a degree where it actually, it, it caused him to react in moments and not overreact in despair, not overreact in fear, not overreact, come on, in any other way except of hope, come on, of joy, of peace. He writes to a church in Galatia and actually says, there is a fruit of the Spirit. In other words, I have a byproduct of a prime product, right? It was the Holy Spirit at work in me that caused these things to come yeah, out. Right. The beautiful part is you and I also can have, a, have access to the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. 
Like you can have joy under pressure. Wow. You can have, the, and listen, not just man-made joy or happiness. I'm talking about a supernatural joy. Yeah. Like let's just break that down. It's super, it's natural, and it's a joy. It's, it's, it's something beyond what you and I can produce in ourselves. And Paul is saying that as the final conclusion to his letter. He may not ever see them again. He, he's basically writing his goodbyes in many ways, but yet he does it with great joy. So I, I go as far to say this, um, life will produce pressures, but faith will produce joy. Life will produce pressure. It is inevitable that you're going to face that pressure. You can't escape pressure. And we always think, man, yeah, pressure, I'm just trying to escape pressure. It's, it's life. Life will have pressure moments. Whether you're a Jesus follower or not, pressure is going to happen. But when pressure happens, I'm here to tell you, faith can produce joy. Come on. Yeah. Faith can produce joy. Yeah. So let's answer that question through these closing moments that Paul has as he writes his letter to the Philippian church. Let's answer the question, how does faith affect me when I'm under pressure? Mm-hmm. Or how does that faith produce that joy? What does faith do for me? And maybe you're watching this, you're saying, I'm not a faith person. I'm here to tell you, maybe you should try it. Yeah. Maybe you should try it. True. Because pressure is going to come to all of us. And there is a response you and I can have. We can overreact in fear or we can overreact in faith. Yeah. Yeah. I, for one, would rather overreact in faith. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so here's, here's basically we're going to answer this question. How does faith affect me when I'm under pressure? Well, number one, faith causes you to look for moments of praise and gratitude. Yeah. That's what faith does. So Paul actually writes, again, Philippians 4, verse 10 to 13, he says this, How I praise the Lord that you are concerned about me again. I know that you've always been concerned for me, but you didn't have the chance to help me. In other words, I love that the opening part is he says, I just, I just praise the Lord. Yeah. Like, can, can we just break that down for a moment? Did Paul have any reason to praise God in that moment? Any logical reason? Any like, you know, I praise the Lord because I'm actually getting set free tomorrow. I praise the Lord because I actually, I, I, I'm about to go before the court and they're about to basically let me off for, for, for the crime they think that I've been you know, guilty for. He actually has no reason to say that except he made a choice. He made a choice to praise. He made a choice that regardless of what was happening, I actually, I actually, because of the faith within me, I look for moments to praise and have gratefulness in my heart. Yeah, so, so if I could put it this way, um, there is a road of responses you and I drive down all the time. I'll put it this way. Like if you are driving down the road of response, there is a fork in the road. And the response could either be to despair, it could be to negativity, it could be to hopelessness, or it could be to praise and gratitude. Here's the thing. You can't go down both roads at the same time. You can't. So, so there is a choice you can make. You, can, you can't go, well, I'm just going to go down the negative one and eventually and go down praise and gratitude. No, you can't. There's a choice because you cannot be grateful and worried at the same time. You can't. You can't act, I dare you to try it right now. Worry about something and then get grateful. You cannot do both at the same time. Why? Because it's a fork in the road of the response I'm going to make. And Paul says, well, as for me and my soul, I'm not going to go down that road. Yeah, I'm going to go down right. the road where I'm going to be grateful and I'm going to praise God. And he looked for reasons to praise God. Yeah. He actually says, you know what, guys? You didn't even get to help me, but I'm just grateful that you thought about it. Yeah. Yeah, wow. yeah, come on. Like, hey. You know what? We've been thinking about you as a church for all those out there. And maybe we haven't been able to get to you, which we men, we've tried our best. But hey, isn't it good to know that people are thinking about Come you? Come on. Yeah. yeah. Isn't it good to know that there's people who are like, man, my, my intentions have been with you the whole time. And this, man, as much as we would so love to embrace our church right now, we would love to hug you. We'd love to give you that welcome in the foyer with a cup of coffee. And we'd love to do it, but we can't. But I'm telling you right now, we should praise God because man, we, our intentions are there. Yeah. Yeah. And we can be grateful. And that's what Paul's saying. Let, that actually produces a joy in you when you choose praise and gratitude yeah. over the doubt and despair. So can I ask you a question? What can you be grateful for right now? Mm-hmm. Like I know things are under pressure. I get it. There's pressure at work. There's pressure around finances. There's all, but just stop and go, God, well, I'm going to stop looking down that road and I'm just going to look at a grateful thing. I'm grateful I got to spend some more time with my kids. Wow. I'm grateful that I, that I wasn't rushing from A to B so quickly because there was no A to B to get to because it was all closed. Yeah. Like, I'm just, gr- look for gratefulness. Yeah. It will produce joy in you yeah. under pressure. Yeah. Secondly, what does faith affect? Well, how does it affect me when I'm under pressure? Well, secondly, faith changes your source of contentment. Faith changes your source of contentment. He says, not, not that I've, I was ever in need. He says, like, you've been trying to help me, but guess what? I've actually been good. Like, I don't know about you, but imagine having a friend like that. 
I actually don't need anything from you. I'm good. I'm content. Like, I, am, I have actually reached a point where I don't need you to make me feel better about me. That's called a content person. Yeah, well. If you find that person, marry him. <laughs> Put a ring on it straight away. Like, that is an amazing thing to have in a human person. But watch this. He says, Not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live with almost nothing or with everything. I've learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it was with a full stomach or empty, with plenty. He says, for I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. You know what the word contentment means? It means completely happy or satisfied. Completely happy or satisfied. And I'm preparing this. And to be honest with you, I ask myself the question, when was the last time I was completely happy or satisfied? Maybe ask that question yourself. When was the last time you stopped? You said, you know what? I'm completely happy and completely satisfied. Because we actually live in a world right now that says you should never arrive at that. Yeah. Yeah. Don't arrive at it. Don't you dare. Because, man, that means you haven't, you haven't got enough ambition. You haven't got enough drive because, man, you need to have more and you have to have more. And that's what it's all about, getting more. But can I tell you, true contentment is actually, you know what? I'm completely satisfied yeah. right now. Yeah. Yeah. I'm completely great. happy right now. Yeah. Wow. And you say, well, James, well, how do I arrive at that? How do I get to that? Because that would be, that would be nice. Because the truth is, it's a tiring journey yeah. for complete satisfaction and complete happiness. Yes. It is tiring. It is exhausting. I'm trying to get, man, I just, I want to. And, and here's the thing, we get glimpses of it. And unfortunately, we put our contentment in people. We make them responsible for our satisfaction, them responsible for our complete happiness. But here's the thing, nothing in this world could ever bring you complete satisfaction or happiness. Yeah. And that is the thing. C.S. Lewis said it like, hey, guess what? Maybe, just maybe, if you can't find on this earth what satisfies your soul, maybe what, what you're looking for is actually out of worldly. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Maybe it's actually beyond this world. Yeah. Have you ever asked that? Have you ever questioned that? That maybe the reason why she or he didn't make you feel fully complete or satisfied or that career didn't make you fully complete or satisfied was because maybe they could never do it because you are not designed to be fulfilled by things from this world, but something outside of this world. And that is what Paul is saying. I have found contentment, but it wasn't in a person. It wasn't in a place. It wasn't in a position. It was in the person of Jesus Christ. So let me tell you, let let me tell you that contentment, listen, satisfaction or contentment isn't found in more stuff. Satisfaction and contentment is found in more Jesus. It's found in more Jesus. So just, God, I want more of you. And if you're feeling a lack of contentment, just go, God, I I just want more of you. And here's here's what I love about this. I've got to move on. Too much to say. But guess what he says? Um, He says, I've learned this. I've learned this. Which means then he didn't always get it right. That's true. He didn't always get it right. Yeah. So you don't beat yourself up in this moment. Well, oh, flip, man, yeah, I probably should. I want more of Jesus and I, I am searching for that. Don't beat yourself up because Paul is an old man writing from prison. He said, you know what? Yeah, I've been there too, but I finally learned I can do all things through him. Yeah. He is hey, the source. So not, those, not all things through him and this. Yeah. Not all things through him and that career. Not in, all things through him and her or, or, that career, or that relationship. He says, no, it's just all things through Christ. Yeah. He is the source of my strength. He is the source of my contentment. So that's what faith leads you to. Faith changes your source of contentment, Mm. the source of it. Number three, faith actually compels you to focus. And this is unusual how this even gets into this portion of the letter, really. Seems off topic. But faith compels you to focus more on giving than receiving. It really does. And, And this is actually a great source of joy. Paul says this in verse 15, As you know, you Philippians were the only ones who gave me financial help when I first brought you the good news and then traveled on from Macedonia. No other church did this. This to me is one of the most profound little portions of Scripture because Paul actually planted, he wrote almost two-thirds of the New Testament book of the Bible, most of these letters, and he planted most of these churches, most of the churches in the New Testament. And he said, guess what? Um, No one else helped me. I planted these churches and I needed help financially and no one else did it except for you, Philippi. Wow. You guys in the church of Macedonia, you're the only guys who actually helped me out. Wow. Isn't that profound? He yeah. says, you're the only guys who did that. No other church did this. And even when I was, I was in Thessalonica, you sent me help once more. Like you sent me more help there as well. I, did, I don't say this because I want a gift from you. Rather, I want, to re- I want you to receive a reward for your kindness. Wow. At the moment, I have all I need and more. I am generously supplied with the gifts you sent me 
from Epaphroditus, who was a guy who was sent from Philippi to give money to Paul while he was in prison. It says, they are, they, watch this, they are a sweet smelling sacrifice that is acceptable and pleasing to God. Yeah. And the same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Yeah. Wow. So Paul actually speaks to the fact that when you have have looked for Jesus as the source of your joy. Faith is doing something in your life. Um, when pressure comes, even financial pressure, even financial pressure, which I think it's so funny we've fallen on this on the last week in the middle of, or in the tail end of a pandemic that has caused financial pressure. Yeah. He, he's actually saying, you know what? Um, you, you still want to be generous. You still want to be, wow. even under pressure. Yeah. And he basically unpackages really quickly three truths about Christian gener generosity. So if you're not a Christian, like, it's all good. I'm, I'm just speaking to Christians for a moment here. This is three truths about Christian generosity. Number one, it's actually our joy to yeah. give. It's our joy. Like there's a reason why, maybe you're not even a Christian, but there's a reason why you felt good when you helped that charity mm -hmm. or when you gave towards fires in January or when you helped sponsor a shop. There's a reason why you felt good about it. Yeah. Have you ever wondered that? Let me tell you, it wasn't evolution that produced that in you. Yeah. It's you tapping into the very nature of God. Yes. Generosity is his nature. Yeah. And when you give, you actually experience heaven for a moment. Come on. Come on. You experience Come on. heaven. Yeah. And you're like, why do I feel that? Why does it feel so good? Because you're experiencing the, perf the perfect love and generosity of God in that moment. Yeah. And that's, what, that's why Christians, we can give with such joy. Yeah. We, we actually do it. And, and, and the second thing, it's our joy to do this. Secondly, it's actually our duty. And I need to speak to believers here for a moment. It's our duty to give. Yeah. Like there is two people in this world. There's customers and there's partners. Mm -hmm. there's, there's customers and there's partners. I'm talking about with, even within the church world and outside. There's customers and there's partners. Let me explain this. Um, when, when, when you have a business, if someone is a customer, what are you doing? You're serving them. You're giving towards them. You want to help them. But when you are a partner, what are you doing? You're part of doing the serving, doing the loving, doing the giving. And unfortunately, what has crept into the church is a lot of Christians have just become customers when they're meant to be partners. Yeah. Wow. They're meant to be, and Paul's actually saying this. He's saying, you know what? Um, hey, hey, church in, in Philippi, you're the only guys who got this. Wow. Wow. Everyone else was happy to be a customer, to hear the good news of the gospel, enjoy church, enjoy church community, be the only guys who got it and realized we're actually meant to be partners. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and this, I'll talk brave about this because yes. I know how integral we are about money in our church. Yeah. But here's the thing. Um, guess who the customer is? The world. Mm -hmm. The world. Yeah. Guess who the partners are meant to be? The Christians. Yes. Oh, we great. are the partners that's in this. Yeah. We make this happen. Yeah. Yeah. You're watching this right now. Guess how we're able to watch it? Because a bunch of people partnered through giving and bought the stuff yes. that we have in order to do church online. We've seen nearly 80 people come to Christ in oh. the last 10 oh. weeks in our church. Yeah. Guess what? You're a partner in that. So we're not giving because, well, that's just what Christians do. No, we give because we're partners in the work of the gospel. Yeah. And we are happy to be partners about it. And we take it from the fact that this now is, not, I'm not in a hotel anymore. This is my home. Come on, C3 Home. Like, this is our home. I'm not here just to consume. I'm here to give towards the mission of seeing other people come to Christ. So generosity is our duty to give. It's our duty because we are partners in spreading the gospel. Last but not least, it's not just our joy, our duty, but it's also our worship. It's our worship. Paul says your, he actually goes back to an Old Testament reference of what sacrifice actually looked like. When people came to worship in the Old Testament, here's what's profound. They never came empty handed. There's not one reference to people showing up to the temple to worship God empty handed. Yeah. Worship always came with sacrifice yeah. all the time. Worship always came with offering. And, and he says in the Old Testament that when you did that, that generosity, it said it was like a sweet smelling fragrance unto the Lord. Like my wife right now is all about scented candles and that, what is it like a, what is that machine thing called, babe? A diffuser. We got diffusers everywhere in our house. Seriously, it's like, if you didn't know they were diffusers, you'd think we had a smoking problem. Like there is so much, it's just mist everywhere. But here's the point of that diffuser. You can get scents and you walk into spaces in a house. You're like, oh, that's good. Sounds like that's tropical mist. Like, I don't know what it's called, but you know, you, you, you smell it. And the Bible actually says that when you and I are generous, God's like, oh my gosh, I smell that generosity. He's like, wow, it's like a fragrance 
that he enjoys from his people to see them being generous. It's a worship when we give. So worship's not just this, where we sing, which we will do after this message. It's not just that. Worship is when we give. Yeah. And Paul says, hey, that is what faith produces in it. So whenever the world is under pressure financially, guess what? Yeah, we're going to feel some pressure, but it's not going to stop our generosity. Yeah. Wow. It's not going to stop us giving because yeah. we, it's our joy, it's our duty, and it's our worship. Yeah. Number four, faith actually leads me to love and unity. Yeah. When faith starts to, and, and things start to have pressure, the pressure doesn't divide us, it unites us. It unites us. So he says this, he's, he's in a pressure moment, he says, give my greetings to each of, the God, of God's holy people, all who belong to Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me send their greetings and all the rest of God's people send you their greetings too, especially those in Caesar's household. Let me explain this for a moment. He's in prison and Paul has never stopped preaching the gospel even when he's in chains. And the people who are in Caesar's household have heard about this and he has led some of them to the truth, the knowledge of Jesus' saving grace. And now it's spreading in Rome. Wow. And he says, hey, guys, in Philippi, you haven't met these guys yet, but they send their greetings. They're also <laughs> part of the family now. <laughs> They're part of the family now. And it, and it unites us. Under pressure, Christians, we unite. Come on. And we need to speak into this for the moment because what's happening in our world is truly horrible. Yeah. People are being divided. And even amongst believers right now, I hear the dividing tones in people's comments and hashtags and all these things in really a moment that is not political. It is a justice based situation. Oh, wow. yeah. And in these times, it's not, for us, it's not for us as the church to shy away, but it's for us to love and unite in these moments to represent what Jesus was all about. And I, you want to know what Jesus was all about? Watch this. You can see this is actually in Galatians 3 verse 28. They're no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. For you, we are all one in Christ Jesus. So in this season, it's our time to unite. Yeah. And again, not to unite to bring destruction. No, yeah. unite to bring love and yeah, unity and justice. And when justice wins out, that's when God's love wins out. That's yeah. And so in this season, this is our time to do that. And when pressure comes, we actually unite. I love this quote from Charles Spurgeon. He says this, Satan always hates Christian fellowship. It is his policy to keep Christians apart. Anything which can divide saints from one another, he delights in. He attaches far more importance to godly community than we do. Wow. Since union is strength, he does his best to promote separation. Wow. That is, there is an enemy to our soul and one of his greatest tasks is to divide the church. Yes. Yeah. And please, I, I implore you right now as believers, do not let anything get between us. Let love unite us yes. and let us bring us back to the fact that we might have differences on open-handed so issues, good. but there's some closed-handed ones that we need to unite around. Yeah. And regardless, come on, we do have more in it's common good. than we don't. Yeah. And let's yeah. unite around Jesus because that's, right. that's, that's what right. happens. Even under pressure, come we just draw closer together. Yeah. Number five, last but not least. When you let faith start to build your life under pressure, guess what it also does? It, it actually... It constantly points you back to the grace of God. Constantly. Wow. He says the last closing comments, he says, hey, verse 23, I love this. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you in spirit or be with your spirit, another translation says. Like um, it all comes back to grace. It all comes back to it. It's the same way we start. It's the same way we journey. And it's the same way we'll finish. It's all grace. Grace, by, defini by definition, means unearned, unmerited favour. And we need to come back to that all the time. Yeah. Because there's so much pressure to perform. There's so much pressure to become something in this life. There's always pressures around us. And he says, what are you talking about? That pressure fell upon Jesus on the cross so that you don't have to have pressure for that anymore. You are loved by God. You are graced by God. You're accepted by God. That is the grace of God at work in our hearts. And when I come back to that, come on, joy just starts to erupt in our hearts again. Mm -hmm. He says, always remember the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Just always come back to that. And you're watching this today and you're thinking, man, I, I, I believe, maybe you're right, James. Maybe faith does help me in times of pressure, but maybe I don't deserve to have that relationship with God. Maybe I don't deserve to have that type of faith. Well, welcome to the party. None of us do. Yeah. None of us do. That's why it's called so grace. Yeah. That's why he is rich in mercy, because mercy wouldn't be mercy if you deserved it. Yeah. Yeah. And so we are, we are people all standing under come on the shower the umbrella come the arms of god's beautiful amazing grace yeah. and as we finish here today um you know like life is going to produce pressures i really i believe that i know that we all know that but faith will ultimately produce joy 
And that joy is founded, again, I've barely scraped the surface on this, but that joy is founded on Jesus, that I have found a relationship with Jesus that nothing can shake, nothing can rob me of. And from that place, joy just starts to come out. Yeah. Paul says, man, I can just be joyful because I've, all this stuff is happening in my life because I just let him. Yeah. Pressure was coming. And listen, I didn't, I didn't, it, just, it just came out of me to be joyful, not because I'm a superhuman. It's because I have a, an amazing God who's at work in my heart. Yeah. So good. So when life produces pressure, faith produces joy. So as we finish here today, um, I want to pray for you because I believe that you're watching this and the truth is you do have pressures right now. We all do. And you don't have to do it alone. And the most important person you need to do this life with is, yes, with people. God designed us for community, but also ultimately designed us, designed us for relationship and community with him. Yeah. And so I would love to lead you in a prayer that says, God, I want you in the midst of this right now. Maybe you're feeling pressure. I know there's people right now that the statistics are saying that the anxiety and depression is rising in our country like never before because of this season of pressure. And I want to tell you that God can meet you in the midst of that. Come on. And faith can help you rise above those moments yeah. and bring you a joy that really is supernatural. Yeah. So maybe you've never prayed that prayer. I'm going to ask you to do this. Wherever you're watching this, would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Let's pray this together. Let's ask Jesus into our heart through this prayer and ask Jesus into our journey. Say this. Say, Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus I, thank you for your word today. I thank you for your word today. Thank you that you died on a cross for my sin, for my, sin. For my shame. For my shame. Jesus, help me Jesus, help me to live for you. To live to walk with you. To walk with you. Today, Today I, receive I receive your forgiveness, your forgiveness. And, I and I start my relationship, my relationship with, you. with you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen. 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 Well, if you prayed that prayer today, there's going to be a little pop-up that comes on our online platform. It says, I made a decision. If you click that, we want to celebrate with you, but also takes you to a link that gives you more information about really taking that journey with Jesus and hopefully leading you a place where you can have community because we're meant to do it together and we'd love to do that. Or maybe you have any prayer requests or anything. Hey, please just make sure you, um, you just follow up on all the prompts that we put on our online platform. Uh, and church, as we wrap up here today, we're going to have worship right now as a church. And I want to encourage you to uh, worship with us. And again, maybe you're feeling the weight and the pressure of situations right now. Guess what the Bible says? Put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And so why don't you just start to worship right now and let God start to fill wherever space you're in right now. We can't wait to see you in community groups and viewing parties or online next week at church. We'll see you soon.